I may have been born with a movie poster gene, as I've always felt a rush seeing a beautifully designed movie poster, one that is both a souvenir of the movie experience and a work of art in itself. I see them as forerunners to the work of Ed Ruscha, the painter who uses words and phrases as a key component of his art. Beginning with the exquisite art deco sensuality of Borlero, the first four posters come from Sweden, where artists combine elements of German expressionism and Russian constructivism to, to create an advanced style that is intellectually arresting while maintaining broad audience appeal. Harold Lloyd's signature glasses are the focal point of his star billing, becoming the O's in his name, while the movie crazy title is the diamond square of his mouth. Fred Astaire dances off the Holiday Inn poster with his billing and dimensional perspective. During the golden age of movie poster design, 1930 to 1950, foreign distributors had the freedom to create campaigns targeted to their local audiences. Astaire, the world's most popular dancer, could only be seen on a movie screen, so he becomes the drawer for Holiday Inn. Audiences were clamoring for the exotic personality of Carmen Miranda, though third build, Aber created the definitive Miranda poster for that night in Rio, swaying to samba rhythms in her fruit-filled headdress and costume and bolstered by a rare use of silver paint. When this film was released in Italy after World War II, the Nicholas brothers had appeared in 10 movies and audiences knew that they would be treated to spectacular dancing worth the price of admission. Uh, that was the only poster to immortalize them and it couldn't have been... Um, used in the United States in the 1940s because of the racial situation. Hedy Lamarr um, in White Cargo plays uh, a half-caste jungle vixen whose entrance line, I am Tondaleo, became part of film history. She had a scientific mind that invented wireless communication vital to cell phone technology today. The German posted a Grand Hotel, MGM's all-star drama and the 1932 Oscar winner, is that rare example that artfully combines painting and photography. Photography is also put to narrative use in Accent on Youth as the lavender wash over a smitten Herbert Marshall recedes as he and we enjoy to the young Sylvia Cindy in a vivid orange gown. The bold addition of turquoise further draws you to the vibrancy of her design. When I began creating film posters professionally, I gravitated to painting and illustration, which I believe elevate a movie poster and foster creativity. No artwork is more striking than these three from my favorite American studio period, Warner Brothers 1927 to 39, which I call Peak Design. In Dawn Patrol, the diagonal of Errol Flynn in his cockpit places us in the midst of a World War I dogfight, forcing us to participate. Because of its large four foot by seven foot uh, uh, size, the poster was hung behind my kitchen door and because it was often hidden, I experienced a jolt of action every time the door <laughs> closed. <laughs> Border Town is one of the most desired and admired film posters of the 30s. Day Betty Davis dares us with her pose, hand on hip, cigarette lighted. The design highlight is the use of a positive negative effect that merges her dress with a vertical block in the background. All of these pieces are rich in color, but, make, but we forget that most of these films were filmed in black and white. Columbia went all out for this glamorous Im image of Anne Southern in The Shoppers Girl in Town. Southern was an all-around um, all talent. Here she's depicted as a redhead, but she was off, often a beautiful blonde, as one sees in The Hellcat, with its deco treatment of the curved title crossing a, a rectangular image. We were f close friends, and um, I made a, a work in progress documentary about her called The Sharpest Girl in Town, which is being screened on Saturday at the Railroad Square. <laughs> triangles, triangles are a deco statement, staple, and in the poster of Poor Little Rich Girl, an inverted triangle used for the, <coughs> is used for the supporting actor credits. The artist David O'Leary was a Holocaust survivor who spent the rest of his life drawing the scenes he had witnessed at Auschwitz. One can only marvel at his life force that created a joyful Shirley Temple and dance and then recorded the fate of those that did not survive. 
in curating exhibits and producing the book Gotta Dance, The Art of the Dance movie poster, I realized that one of the posters I collaborated on with Stanley Kubrick and Philip Castle had a key deco element in its, in its um, triangular graphic. Significantly, it was the A in a clockwork orange. Um, Stanley was, uh, was a perfectionist who was stymied deciding on how to shoot the Druga Salt in Clockwork Orange. Finally asked Malcolm McDowell if he could dance. Malcolm began singing Sing in the Rain, accentuating its beats with kicks and cane hits. Kubrick immediately got the rights to the song and a dance attack was born. The stamina needed to win the grueling depression dance contest is glorified in the detailed Art Deco design of Dance Team with the perfectly garbed winners draped over the central trophy graphic and the Astaire and Rogers are the greatest movie dance team. There are ex exceptional designs for their American posters, but dancing in elegant evening attire is the definitive image, and nothing captures their artistry as perfectly as their floating dance in the French poster to Carefree, which is their eighth film and most success sophisticated one. Uh, these posters inspired audiences at the time, and last summer, Jacob's Pillow, I, dis I discovered that they inspired interaction today Craig Black of the Santa Fe Aspen Ballet spent hours creating this image of a perfectly positioned leap between all the artists pictured in, in the banner uh, to the exhibit. The pre-code period held through the early 30s before the production code found their teeth. It then demanded that crime had to pay and married couples couldn't sleep in the same bed. This fabulous poster to Footlight Parade is nearly as revealing as Bolero, and I suspect it escaped the censor's wrath by insisting that Blondell and Ruby Keeler were actually clothed by their body paint. <laughs>